Well, if you grew up watching the TV show The Monkees in the 1960s, or in reruns in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and right up until today, you've seen our guest this hour, Valerie Carries Vinay, numerous times on that program. But there's more to her story than just Mickey, Mike, Peter, and Davey. Valerie has appeared in many films and television programs that are part of our cultural consciousness. And I know I'm interested in hearing all about them, and I bet you are too. Valerie, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. You know, I associate you with Southern California and uh, the movie and television industry. Are you a born and bred California girl? No, oh. um, not born here, but I've been in California since 1952, so I would say I'm a native Californian. Where was your family from originally? I was born in, in Germany, oh. and I was born during the war, during World War II, and uh, I was born in April of 1945. And the war ended in May 1945. So I was born in a displaced persons camp. Hmm. So my parents really went through a lot because they were there during all the horrors and everything. But uh, I do remember Germany. Um, I came to the United States when I was four or five right. years old. There's an argument amongst the relatives. You know, but, um, I did come through Ellis Island, even though Ellis Island uh, stopped bringing people through there in 1924, I think. But if you were sick, and I was, um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what I had. Um, I think my mother called it measles, but her translation from Lithuanian to English didn't really... You know, sometimes it wasn't correct. Right. So um, that's all I know. <laughs> well, you know, it's a funny thing. I can't remember what I did last week, but I can remember what I did when I was four, when I was three. And it's those early years, that's when all the imprinting happens. Yes. First five years, I think. Yeah. That's true. Um, I still think about it a lot. You know, I think about uh, the soldier that uh, was an American soldier who gave me my first piece of chocolate in front of the barracks. And uh, our favorite pastime, uh, running around with, uh, following my brothers, you know, actually through barbed wire fences. They were digging up ammunition, so that was the type of thing that was going on then. Uh, of course, you know, as a child, I, I was just having a good time. And thank God that we were one of the families chosen to come to the United States. You know, sometimes yeah. I just want to lay down and kiss the ground and thank God that I'm here. So growing up in Southern California, did you cultivate an interest in performing, or was it part of the family background? Yes. Um my mother loved to sing. She was a singer that never really uh, went anywhere, but, you know, in church and choirs and, right. and uh, things like that. She loved singing. My uncle, my mother's brother, loved uh, singing. And my um, father, uh, I learned recently, was in an acting troupe. Wow. You know, one affiliated with the church, but... Um, so, yes, there was, uh, there was that influence that I uh, really didn't realize until recently. And I remember watching television. Oh, and I came to California in 1952, but I came to the United States in 1949, or I think it was 50. And um, we lived in Lowell, Massachusetts for a couple of years. Oh, birthplace uh, of our, uh, Jack Kerouac. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> there you go. So, Little tidbit. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And uh, and yes, um, I you know always wanted to be on that stage or more so on television. I think because 
you know, I grew up watching uh, Rin Tin Tin and um, uh, what was that other show that I was, I had the crush on that little boy that was so blonde and oh, you're he talking rode about... on an elephant. Yeah. That guy, that that guy, you know, you know, the one that's in the monkey. Yeah. What was his yeah, name? That, I can't... That, oh, I had, yeah. you know, I, I, I was just so impressed with that and, uh, <laughs> and him. So, yes, I definitely, um, you know, visualized my future, I think. Nancy Sinatra with her version of Hooray for Hollywood. Our guest this hour is actress Valerie Carries Vinay. And your discovery, Valerie, in show business is one of those Hollywood stories that people don't think actually happen. But in your case... It did. You you weren't out, uh, you know, pounding the pavement looking for work at a Hollywood studio. It, Hollywood came to you. Yes. Uh huh. Um, my friend uh, now he's passed on, Michael McLean. Um, I I had a, a part time job uh, in high school, you know, uh, after school, and it was for some opticians, and he. Uh, with one of the customers that came in, I, to this day, I think it was a setup from one of the opticians that I was working with, but I was a receptionist modeling the glasses, and he said, have you ever thought about being in the movies? <laughs> I said, well, yes, I have <laughs> thought about it, <laughs> and it turned out that his father was the head of talent at 20th Century Fox. Of course, he he was you know, a very nice young man, and, and we started dating and every. I think he was a starving actor at the time, too. And um, he's the one that actually put me in the motion picture industry, and he became a casting director later. You know, fair-haired boy of NBC and ABC sure. and uh, all of the networks, and he cast, uh, let's see... He helped cast, um, in the early days, The Sound of Music, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, The Great White Hope, and major things, you know. And uh, he's the one that uh, put me in Batman, actually. So uh, we remained friends, you know, forever. And uh, I just love him very much. And I'm sorry that he left us. Yeah. Is he the reason that... You appeared in Your Cheatin' Heart. The, that's the first movie. Yes. The movie set you were yes. probably first on, right? My goodness, you know so much. That's George I Hamilton, would... of all people, playing Hank yeah. Williams. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. And that was frightening. Oh, my preparation for that. I, I was scared to death, of course. You know, <laughs> course. going on uh, to work on a, a real movie set. And uh, for the first time, that was in 1964. Do you have any memories of being on that set with George Hamilton, who, you know, at that point, well, I'm sure he was tan even then. I'm sure he was, yeah. too, but I was so um, self-absorbed with my own nervousness that, uh, that no, I, and, and I'm, I was sure that everybody was looking at me, even though there were a thousand people there on that day. You know, it was one of those calls that, that you know, I was a part of a, of a huge audience. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. But, but for me, it was, it was a big thing. Well, the next film you were involved in was an even bigger thing because you got to work with Hollywood royalty. Shock unequaled in the history of the screen as the Associates and Aldrich Company present Betty Davis. You're a vile, sorry little trap. Olivia de Havilland. How was I to know it would end in murder? Joseph Cotton in Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte, co-starring Agnes Moorhead. What's going on up there that you don't want me to see? Cecil Kellaway, Victor Buono, and Mary Astor. <laughs> He's dead! <laughs> Suspense that starts with an agonized whisper and mounts to a shattering climax. In those days, on the set, you had one of those aluminum coffee makers, you know, that's about two and a half feet tall. And, yeah. 
and let, you know that you would you would have at your house for a house party or whatever and um and some styrofoam cups some donuts and we would all gather around that that and and we were I remember sitting around with Joseph Cotton and Bruce Dern oh. uh, and just sitting there chatting you know um uh, it was um Different then. The movie industry has changed. Uh, it, you know, everybody's got these uh, huge trailer dressing rooms now that um, you don't really get a chance to visit with the big stars. But right. in those days, I'm so grateful that I was able to work at that time and experience that because it's forever in my heart. You know, the um, and Betty Davis... <laughs> Uh, she was the one that I was working with because she was the one that I stunt doubled. Right. And don't get excited because <laughs> so I'm not a st- real stunt stunt person, but they called it that. It was something having to do with a gun, and I don't know what they did exactly, but it was I was holding a gun, and uh, it was supposed to be her holding a gun. So when you see the hand, it's my hand. You see. <laughs> But so it was a very small thing, but when you're on the set with all of these people, it's a very big thing. And for me, it's a very um, dear memory, and um, and I'll I, I'll I'll always have it. And what I do remember about Betty Davis, she loved me. She really did. She was as sweet as she could be, and and from what I heard and what she did that day. She didn't like anybody hanging around while they were shooting. So she screamed, everybody off the set, <laughs> except for Valerie. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Wow. She was just as sweet as she could be. I just adored her. And I'm so lucky that I got to meet these people. Joseph Cotton was very dear as well, and um, and Bruce Stern, uh, too. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I was a lucky girl. I still am. I'm still lucky. Jerry loves his co-stars, and New York loves his three on a couch. We're back talking to actress Valerie Carey's Vinay on the Vintage Rock and Pop Shop, and tell us about Jerry Lewis. Ah, oh, I love Jerry. Um, I met him. My friend um, Leslie Parrish, who was in Little Abner, she was Daisy May. Mm-hmm. She was in Star Trek. She was Manchurian Candidate with Lawrence Harvey. She was the Queen of Hearts. She was his girlfriend. Right. Um, she is a saint. She took me under her wing. She. Uh, knew that, you know, I was very interested in acting, and I, I didn't really know anything about it, or, or um, I didn't know how to be on a set. She showed me what marks were, how to hit the marks. She showed me, um, talked about lights and, um, you know, how they hit your eye and, and, and everything. And, and she uh, sent me to her photographer, Irv Glazer, that's uh, G L A S E R, and uh, the photo that I have up on my Facebook page right now, where I mentioned that I was going to do a radio show in New Jersey. Okay, <laughs> uh, is an Irv Glazer photo. He was just a master at uh, photographing people and a really nice person, and so she really helped me. And then she took me to meet Jerry. And that was on a movie called Three on a Couch. Right. And um, I met Jerry, and and he immediately took a liking to me. And uh, he was always so kind to me. He was was very good to all of the people that worked for him that I could see, Mm, except for one that I saw that the chemistry just wasn't right. So uh, that wasn't working out too well, but right. mostly he was really good. 
on the stage door, he would have, you know, come in. Everybody is welcome. You know, he welcomed people to come in. I think uh, Jerry is so misunderstood sometimes. I don't know. Uh, But for me, he was a mentor. He taught me a lot. I learned a lot. I was very impressionable at that age, too. You know, I... um, uh, like you say, the first five years, uh, well, that was my first five years in the movie industry. Right. And uh, I was like a sponge, just taking everything in and uh, noticing how they're, how, you know, why is it master over the shoulder, over the shoulder all the time? <laughs> what, why is that? What is, you know, what, what are they doing here? I was just so curious, and um, and I learned so much, and and Jerry was a mentor. He told me never throw in the towel. He told me to stick with it. He told me to, um, you know, no matter what happens, stay in the industry. And mm-hmm. I think that he was absolutely right. I, I love the motion picture industry. They're the kindest, most wonderful people in the world. And uh, I was so uh, lucky to have these people that influenced me. But uh, Jerry, um, he, he was, uh, have you ever seen him dance? Fantastic. Yeah, Great. and he's all self-taught. He's, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, working with him, there he'd be hanging from the rafters on the stage, fixing a light, or, or down on the ground putting marks down, or, you know, just doing everything. And that meant a lot to me, too, because what I learned from him is that when you're on a project, you must do everything that you possibly can to make it a success. And um, he was a real good teacher without preaching, you know. He He would just do, and it was just amazing to watch him. And uh, and the video that he would do then, or I think it, there's another name for it. Well, video, video assist. Well, he was the very first one that when he would shoot a scene, let's say he was in a scene, he would play it back. Right. In those days. Nobody else had that. I know. Now it's standard. Now everybody's got it. Now it's standard, yeah. yeah. But in those days, it was not, and 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 that was amazing in itself too. That because uh, I had never seen that before with anybody else that I worked with. So he was amazing. He was an amazing man. I Let, loved him very much. Let's talk about four other amazing men you worked with: Mickey, Mike, Davy, and Peter, the monkeys. And you were on that show numerous times playing all sorts of different characters. And as I understand it, you began working on that show as a stand-in, right? Uh, that's one thing that um, Michael McLean's father, Owen McLean, he, he, he was head of talent at 20th Century Fox for 33 years. Mm-hmm. And the one thing that he wanted me to do is stand-in, because I didn't have any acting experience. So he wanted me to be glued to that camera all the time to see how it works. And it, I, I got to say, you know, now the stand-ins get uh, screen credit, you know, and they even recite the lines and memorize the lines right. or read the lines. And they're more recognized, let's say, than they used to be. So I had um, a call um, in those days, telephone, my my roommate said, you know, uh, someone called from the casting agency and said that you should uh, go at 11 o'clock, or I don't know exactly what time it is, but you know what I mean, uh, to stage, I think it was 7, on the Columbia lot. And I was working on the Columbia lot, you know, with Jerry. I think I was working with Jerry at that time. Yeah, that would make sense, yeah. Yeah, so I went uh, to the stage, uh, walked on the stage, and it was totally almost dark. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been on a soundstage, but they're huge. Yeah. 
and yeah. very eerie when when it's dark, when there are no lights, no crew, no camera, no nothing. And there was this one little light, so I followed that, and I went over, and I thought, well, this is odd. There's nobody here. You know, what kind of a gag is this? And uh, then I heard footsteps, and it was Bert Schneider, and he was, um, you know, one of the producers, uh, uh, creators right. of The Monkees. And um, he interviewed me. I remember he said, can you travel? Because I guess a lot of people can't travel due to families sure. or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, and I said, yes, I can travel. And he said, would you mind standing in for a young man? And I <laughs> said, no, I don't mind standing in for a young man. I, all I was thinking was, I got to get the rent paid. Right, yeah. That's the important and thing. And I've got to keep gas in my car, and I've got to keep the lights on. And, you know, I mean, my rent at the time was $80 a month, if you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I could find yeah. an apartment like that now. Yeah, $80. Yeah. No, it was a house. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it was a house in Sherman Oaks, California. <laughs> so, anyway, I took the um, the job, and uh, it turned out to be the monkey's. And uh, we went to San Diego for the pilot. Right. And so uh, that was the traveling part. And uh, I just fell in love with those guys. They were all so sweet. They were all so fresh, so good, so excited about what they were doing. And, uh, And good musicians. As a matter of fact, when the pilot finished, you know, I think I was making more money than than the boys. Um, not sure about that, but it's <laughs> very possible. Um, Peter, he uh, kind of didn't have a place to stay, so I called my roommate and I said, "You know, can, would you mind if I brought home this actor who doesn't have a place to stay?" You know, they they were going to have to wait until the pilot was picked up. Right, right. So my roommate said, yes, yeah, sure. She said, we'll give him the downstairs. You know, he can sleep on the couch there. And so I brought Peter home <laughs> with me. And uh, and then he went to stay with uh, Michael and, and Phyllis. Right. And I, I took him over to Michael's house uh, after that. But um, But that was wonderful because Peter... You know, uh, is a, was a fine musician, and uh, he, I said, where's your banjo? And he <laughs> said, oh, he said, I had to pawn it, I was broke. Oh. And I said, oh, no. I said, we can't have that. And so, you know, we went to the pawn shop, and I got that out for him. Oh. That's the first time I'm saying that, telling this story publicly. But um, bless his heart, I yeah. loved Peter so much. Hello again. Thank you. Well, you were on the Monkees over a dozen times, and each time you played a uh, different character. You know, really the truth of that is, there I was every day because I was standing in for Davy. So right. I was on the set every day that Davy was on the set. The way that show was shot, it wasn't like your traditional um, television series is shot. It was different. I, I don't know. It was just different. And so they would come up with things at the spur of the moment, like, um, oh, we need a girl. We need a girl in here. And, oh, Valerie can do it. And they'd throw me in there, you know, put this hat on, put a jacket on, put this on, do this. You know, and I go, okay, okay, okay. And that's how that happened. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know how I ended up in so many of them, but I did. And it was strictly, I I don't think um, that they ever thought about, oh, you know, do something, um, you know, they weren't writing all of those things in for me. It was, um, I was on time. I went to work on time and I didn't cause any problems with anybody and everybody liked me and I liked everybody. 
And that's what really, you know, helps when you're working on a project is uh, people getting along and, and um, um, being encouraging to each other. So, you know, um, that was me. Well, you, you mentioned... <laughs> and I, I, I think it was Andrew Sandoval that told me, um, he said, do you realize that you were in almost as many episodes as the monkeys themselves? And no, I didn't realize it. I didn't realize that anybody even noticed me until I got on Facebook, and I think that that was um, in 2010. I started getting all of these messages from people, and I was floored. Uh, Say, listen, we understood you had a new editor. The monkeys probably had more pressure on them than anybody in show business at that time because here they are doing a, a tv show which was what 14 hour days or, or something like that something like that mm-hmm. yeah and then recording yeah. at night or doing yeah. concerts or yeah. something that anybody else yeah. would have gone out of their minds but boy they 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 picked the right guys obviously for they this. sure did yeah they sure did pick the right guys um really the nicest uh guys in the world i i do consider them family my tv brothers <laughs> i i know they do uh love me and i love them very much and and it was so great on that set and you're right they had so much pressure on them and everything but every morning on the set you know you walk out to see what they're lighting you know get your coffee or whatever and walk out see what they're lighting or what they're setting up there and um, and here comes Davy and big hug, big kiss, you know, good morning, and then you know more arms around me. Oh, there's Peter, and you know, good morning and hugs, you know, hug Mickey, hug, hug Michael, and that's the way we were. Um, my relationship with them, very loving, very loving, to this day, you know. Yeah. These uh, guys are 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 so so much a part of my life. Obviously, everyone was saddened when uh, Peter passed away recently, and of course, Davy before him. And I wanted to ask you about both of these gentlemen. Certainly, with Peter, you know, he was a brilliant musician who didn't get the credit that he deserved, and I think. In death, people were starting to look back at at his career and and realizing how how brilliant he was. He was brilliant. He was also a teacher in high in a high, he was a high yes. school teacher yeah, in the right. interim of you know hard times or whatever. And uh, from what I understand, um, I know Nick and I were were living in Topanga Canyon at the time, and one of the uh, little girls who used to babysit once in a while. She said, well, Peter is my, is my, uh, I forget, but I think it was history teacher. Something, something like that, yeah. Yeah, and she just loved him. They lo- The students loved him, and that's something in high school. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> you know? It is something, yeah. That's something in high school. So, he, you know, he was, uh, he was so, such a good person. He, you know, he was such a good person. I I saw him, I didn't get, you know, he lived in Connecticut, so I didn't get to see him a lot, uh, but I did see him in Carmel when they did their uh, 50th anniversary concert. Mm-hmm. And he came up out of, the, out of the bowels of the theater, you know, after the show and, and right. got me and took me downstairs and... Um, to where everybody was, and I, uh, that's that picture. Oh, that's that wonderful. Saw. Rich Dart is um, their drummer, and uh, he took that picture. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. a great picture. Yeah. I'm so thankful that I have that. And um, I, you know, I don't know what to say because I get kind of choked up thinking about it. Um, and the next time I saw Peter, he was at the Pantages, right. and that was the last time that I saw him. 
and uh, it, I have another picture that I post once in a while of a picture, a selfie that he took. I said, Peter, I don't know how to take selfies, you know, so he took my my phone and took a selfie of us. <laughs> took a couple of them. One is really terrible. I don't think he'd want me to post it, but the, but the one I posted, and, and, and God bless his heart, and uh, I'm so sorry he's gone. I'm so sorry Davey's gone. I saw Davey two weeks before he died. Mm. He was doing an autograph show, and I went, I said, I've got to see him, and I went to the Marriott over by uh, the Bob Hope Airport here, right? and, oh, we talked, and he was telling me about a barn that he was um, demolishing. You know, he loved his horses and everything. And I guess he was going to put a new roof or something on it. And he lived in, he had one farm in Beavertown, right. Pennsylvania, and another one in Florida somewhere. So he said he was doing some demolition, and he said that night, he said, Valerie, I went to bed, and he said, oh, I have such chest pains. And I was horrified. I, you know, you've got to go to a doctor. You've got to, you know, what do you mean? He said, no, 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 it's from the demolition. And I'm going, no, you need to go to the doctor, you know, and get that checked out. And uh, two weeks later, he was dead. Oh, oh boy. Yeah. He was a sweet sweet person. Ghosty. That's me, and we're back talking with actress Valerie Carries Vinay, and I wanted to ask you briefly here as we start to wrap up about uh, the Raquel Welch movie, Myra Breckenridge. Yeah, I can't tell you who was in it. Yeah, but, it was a but, cr- uh, crazy lots movie. Of pe- lots of people were in it, and... Um, I guess it was, I, I've never seen the movie, though, I have to admit. I'm going to, though, now I can, you know, stream it, I can rent it on my... Oh, um, you know, do so with what? caution. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is, it is a very, very crazy, I, I like these kind of movies, The what, what I, you know, these experimental um, films that they, they might not be to everyone's taste, and, and you might need to watch it in sections. Because I don't know if it holds up <laughs> as a... 90- Take two aspirin? Yeah, but, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, more more interesting and, and strange than, uh, you know, uh, good. But uh, certainly worth a watch at least once. Well, I'd like to see it. I know the director... Um, we're sitting around a table, and we were supposed to be, we were being taught how to have manners or something. Okay. Table manners. And um, that we were, we were just, um, had no manners at all. And so I immediately grabbed a fork and held it like a knife that you would stab your worst enemy with. Right and stabbed my food like that, and the director loved it. (laughs) So I don't know if he kept it or not, though. Lots of times we end up on that editing floor. I know. know, As you know, as an editor, you you do this (laughs) all the time. Um, I I do know there was a story that you told me. You mess with people's (laughs) lives. (laughs) There was a a story you told me about Raquel Welch's husband. (laughs) And I'd love for you Jim. to tell that I think story. His name was Jim. He's yeah. such a sweet man. And uh, we were working on um, the magnificent men and their flying machines. Now I didn't work on the movie, but I was hired to do publicity for it. So, right. Uh, there, you know, we were in the period costumes and everything, which were so uncomfortable, cinched in, <laughs> right. and. Um, and I was sitting in a limousine, and he was talking to me through the window. So there we are. We're chatting and everything, and I'm fidgeting around with the uh, buttons on the, on the limousine. And I hit the wrong one, and the window went up. And he was, 
was going, whoa, 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 no, no, stop, stop. And I didn't, I, I mean, everything turned out okay, thank God. Yeah. But, um, it, you know, it's funny now, but it wasn't, it wasn't funny. Well, I sure, think. yeah, nearly Poor decapitating guy. Raquel Welch's husband is, yeah, that would right. be, <laughs> that wouldn't be hilarious at that and, moment. And you yeah. should have seen his poor head was sideways, you know. <laughs> Because he was standing, so he had to, you know, kind of lean down to the window. Right. So, oh, God, I'll tell you. <laughs> that was a funny, that was funny. Magnificent men and their flying machines. You know, before I let you go, I wanted to mention your late husband, Nick Vinay, who was a mover and shaker at Capitol Records. He was kind of the king of Capitol Records. He worked with everybody on that roster. And I love the Beach Boys, and we, the entire world, would never have heard the Beach Boys had it not been for your husband, Nick Vinay. I mean, the people he worked with and the things he did are just astonishing. Nick is a superstar. And um, he's the real superstar. You know, I, I, I am so lucky that I met him and had him in my life. And, you know, we have a beautiful son. Mm-hmm. And I, it, he, it, the, here's another amazing person that was so talented so very, very talented, and I often think, oh, he would have been fantastic on Facebook. Are you kidding? Oh, yeah. All his the comments. Oh, his... wow. Oh, yeah. His, um, his, uh, um, he was so knowledgeable about everything, everything uh, that you can imagine. He, he, the way, what we really, really had in common was we, both loved Southwest art, Southwest I see, okay. blankets, Southwest jewelry, Southwest um, baskets, pottery. Uh, we loved the people, the American Native people. And uh, he was dedicated uh, to helping them. So we, you know, we were very much involved in... And uh, I started collecting when I was about 13 years old. I started collecting pottery and um, kachinas and things, you know, mm-hmm. sure. things like that. And, uh, and Nick, oh my gosh, he could tell you the whole history of, of one pot, you know. Oh, this is Santa Clara, and there, you know, uh, or this is um, uh, the Shumash, or he... Um, he was a historian. He was a writer. He was. Uh, he certainly knew how to produce. He certainly did. Yeah. I get um, comments all the time. People contact me and tell me uh, one one person uh, that really raves about him, and and I want to thank him right now is Bob Lind. You've heard his song, "The Elusive Butterfly right. of Love," right? You know, and he adored Nick and was actually in the studio with him while Nick was producing Fred Neal. And Fred Neal wrote Everybody's Talking. Right. It was called Echoes at the time. Yes. Yep. But uh, Harry Nielsen is the one that made the hit out of that. Right. You see, Fred Neal was the writer. But um, uh, he just... Uh, is so talented. I I don't even know where to begin to. He was older uh, than I was, so he was also a mentor in my life. And I, you know, I he died when he just turned sixty one years old. He hmm. wasn't even sixty one for one year, you know, uh, not even for a month. He hmm. died, you know. So um, he died. Uh, he had lymphoma. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we lost him, and it's very very sad that he's no longer here. So, but you um, know, we we talked earlier about imprinting. You know that idea, and he's imprinted on records uh, that are certainly going to last forever. There's no question about that. I mean, there's a there's been a big Glenn stu- Campbell. Yes, all yeah. It, it's Glenn it's, Campbell's. Um, 
by the time I get to Phoenix, the album. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really within the past 15 years or so that people have, uh, authors, what have you, have taken a scholarly look at uh, the music industry and the music that was being made in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Andrew Sandoval is a perfect example of somebody who does that. You know, uh-huh. he, he's a historian and he documents everything. And yes. I can tell you, just based on my interests, which include a lot of artists that worked at Capitol Records, your husband's name pops up every, every book I read. <laughs> There's, yes. Yeah, it's like uh-huh, every other chapter. True. There he is, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, I'm going to have to wrap this up because I, I we're, okay. we're going to be running out of time. But people can go, I guess, to your Facebook page. I, mostly, I'm on my um, Valerie Carries Vinay on Facebook. And I, you know, I've been Valerie Vinay for a hundred years, but. One of the people that was managing me, she said, when she started the uh, page for me, she said, you can't just be Valerie Vinay because nobody knows who that is. And uh, they do know who Valerie Carries is, so we've got to insert that name. So that's how that came about, and my maiden name. And, right. um, and then I have the Valerie Carries fan page. I do post on that once in a while. I try to, you know, keep that up. I'm learning a little more about it. But mostly I I can see the Valerie Carey's Vinay page. And again, I want to thank you so much yeah. for coming on and uh, and talking about, well, we really talked about the early days of your uh, career, and I know you've you've done things recently as well, so I don't want to give that uh, short shrift that, you know, you... You actually did... Uh, some, I'm still available. You're st- <laughs> still available. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> just in case. Yeah, just in case. I'm just very, very thankful for everything. And and I'm thankful that you invited me to, to this interview, David. I really, really do appreciate it. Well, my pleasure, and have a great rest of your day.